Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 2020 Maryland Native Plant Society Conference, From Marshes to Meadows, Exploring Maryland's Grasslands. I'm Jill Swearingen, conference co-chair, along with Marnie Bruce, who's offline. We had organized an in-person conference at Hood College with three speakers. Being new to this webinar technology, we scaled down from three to one. However, Jorge Bogantes Montero will give his talk on Anacostia grasslands on Tuesday, November 24th, and Bill Hillgartner will present on Serpentine Barrens the last Tuesday in January 2021. So stay tuned. Maryland Native Plant Society chose grasses as our featured plant group for this year. The spring issue of Marylandica provides a nice introduction to grasses and grass-dominated communities in Maryland. According to the Maryland Natural Heritage Program's Plant Atlas, there are just under 400 species of grasses in the state. We'll continue to feature grasses as well as other graminoids, the sedges and rushes, in 2021 to allow more time to learn about these essential components of our flora. Maryland offers a wide diversity of grassland communities, including shale barrens, serpentine barrens, glades, wetland meadows, Delmarva bays, shrub swamps, forested wetlands called flatwoods sometimes, and tidal marshes. Botanist extraordinaire Rod Simmons will be discussing these communities at the MNPS monthly program on October 27. Our speaker, Dwayne Estes, serves as executive director for the Southeast Grasslands Initiative, which he co-founded in 2017. For his leadership in developing the SGI, the Tennessee Wildlife Federation recognized him as Tennessee Conservationist of the Year. Duane also serves as professor of biology at Austin Pay University, a state university in Clarksville, Tennessee, and is curator of the APSU Herbarium. I'll now hand it off to Greg Elliott, uh, Communications Director, SDI. Good morning, everybody. I'm really happy to be here. But, and um, without further ado, I will turn it over to Duane, who is known to a lot of us as the Prairie Preacher. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Greg. And thank you, everybody. Thanks to the uh, Maryland uh, Native Plant Society for uh, inviting me to, to present. Yeah. Okay, if we're all good, we'll get started then. Um, well, it, like I said, it's a delight to be uh, speaking to you all. And um, I am from Tennessee. And, and um, as, as was introduced, I'm co-founder of the Southeastern Grasslands Initiative. You know, one of the early um, questions that we get as we are expanding our range is, um, you know, is Maryland part of the Southeastern Grasslands Initiative focal region? <clears throat> and um, I'll come to address that because I think that it'll be uh, quite evident from the presentation that there's a lot of southern species in Maryland, and most of you probably are already aware of that. So I've got another working title. Um, the title, of course, of, of the talk is From Marshes to Meadows, Exploring Maryland's Grasslands. Uh, additionally, one of the, um, the titles that I like to sort of use a new title each year for the Southeastern Grasses Initiative talks that we do, and that is that we are also telling an untold story of American history and conservation. So what exactly does that mean? Well, imagine that you're standing on the, the ridge line of Catoctin Mountain in Maryland, and you're looking out across to the west to the Great Valley below. Um, there's a gorgeous sunset in, in, the, uh, in the distance, and that area down below is really a striking scene. And I think a lot of people would be inspired by that scene. But it's also very much an enigmatic and um, uh, very much sort of a, a, a mystical scene in the sense that we really don't know a lot about that landscape and its history. So when I say that we're telling an untold story of American history, what I mean by that is that there is a huge amount of untapped information uh, about the landscape of, of Eastern United States. You know, we've been very good as a society and as historians are very good about the who, what, and the when. But sometimes when it comes to the where, which is 
the necessary fourth part of any good story. Throughout the course of American history, we've actually done a fairly lousy job of describing the where of American history. You know, for example, we talk about the American Revolution and uh, the various battles. We know oftentimes who were the generals and the dates of those battles, and we know what was accomplished. But have you ever stopped to realize how few details there actually are about describing the where, about the land that they lived in, that they roamed across, that they farmed, that they hunted? A lot of that information simply was not uh, recorded well early in American history. And for that very reason, the Maryland area in particular, because it was one of the first regions settled in, on the East Coast, we've lost a lot of information that we will unfortunately never regain. This is a map from uh, 1751. It was produced by Thomas Jefferson's father, Peter Jefferson. And what it shows is a, a zoomed in um, a view of northernmost Virginia, western Maryland, and the southwestern part of Pennsylvania, and the eastern panhandle region of West Virginia. I'll just point out a few of the kinds of features on this map, which are really intriguing. Number one, this is the first accurate map it shows the, the region of the Shenandoah Valley and the Allegheny Mountains and the Upper Potomac River watershed. If you look there um, at the circle that I've provided, if you've ever driven the interstate up I-81 uh, on your way towards DC, you'll notice there's an exit called the Plains. And I often have wondered through the course of time, when I see a road sign like the Plains, was that a name that was given in the 1950s or was it a, a name that was given in the 1840s? But it turns out a lot of our landmarks for our towns and our creeks and our mountain ranges were actually named very early in American history. And they were given oftentimes because of some special feature. So it's no secret that the plains that we see today in Northern Virginia was also named the plains in 1751. Why is that? Well, there's a very good reason. And the reason is part of what you'll come to understand today is that a lot of Northern Virginia was actually grasslands. Let's look at some other cool things that are on this map. We've got Lord Fairfax, uh, who was a very wealthy landowner. Uh, this is prior to the American Revolution. He owned tens of thousands of acres in Northern Virginia. Why did he select the lands that he, uh, that he did? Why was he given those lands? Um, why not go into the mountains of West Virginia, for example? There's probably a reason, and the reason most likely was that those were the choicest lands that were the most fertile. Um, it's the kind of place where you could, you could grow a lot of tobacco and you could grow cotton and other kinds of crops that many of the wealthy plantation owners of the day uh, uh, did. There's Indian roads that are mentioned here. There's, um, you'll see the inscription Hampshire, and that's actually a very interesting uh, term. And, uh, it applies to that region. Lord Fairfax gave it that name. And one of the reasons for that is that at this time in American history, they were bringing over hogs back from, uh, from England that were of the Hampshire breed. And those Hampshire hogs were actually a grazing type of breed of hog. And so they would roam the hillsides. And rather than just simply foraging on chestnuts and acorns, they actually ate a lot of grass and they were more of a grazing type breed. And so there's actually a line of hills in that region today called the Hampshire Hills because they were the grazing range for the hogs that Lord Fairfax and his, um, the, the folks who were under him uh, owned. There are various forts that are mentioned here. Uh, there are wagon roads that are mentioned. There's just a lot of American history that's tied up in this. But what I think is the part of America's history that's untold, that the Southeastern Grasslands Initiative really is telling for the first time, is we're combining these stories of natural history, of how the land, the, the prairies and the forests and the meadows and the wetlands, how they influence American history and how they're tied to the story of American history. That's a, that's a uh, sort of a long running endeavor that we uh, strive to, to do. So again, back to the summit of Mount Catoctin looking west. Um, just imagine then what those valleys were like in, in the 1740s and 1750s. 
Now that you've seen a little bit about that American history overlay onto it, let's begin to look deeper at the natural history of Maryland and get a fuller understanding for uh, the landscape. You know, I've not always been a hi history buff. Um, in fact, it, when I had my very first history class, uh, I was 12 years old, I was in the sixth grade in, uh, down in Tennessee, and I had a teacher named Tommy Johns, and there's two things I remember from Mr. Johns' class. Number one is that he paddled me 13 times for talking too much that year. So um, if I'm still going strong in about two hours, you'll understand why Tommy Johns gave me 13 paddlings. The only academic thing that I seem to recall from that experience was that he said that this, he told this really cool story that uh, early on in class, that at the time that the first Europeans came to the shores of, of North America, that they, they encountered a coastline and a continent that was absolutely covered in forests from the Atlantic Ocean to the Mississippi River. And so dense were these primeval forests that a squirrel could travel from the Atlantic Ocean to the, to the Mississippi without touching the ground simply by traveling through the treetops. Now, if you've ever stood on the backbone of the Great Smoky Mountains in uh, Western North Carolina or East Tennessee, as this image on the right shows, looking out across those endless chains of mountains, it's easy to visualize that squirrel being able to accomplish such a feat. And certainly if we look back to images from the turn of the 20th century and we see American chestnut trees that are 10 feet in diameter and tulip poplars and all these gigantic trees of Eastern forest, um, it's easy to imagine that those once clothed all of the Eastern landscape and that you've got to go to these special places like the Smokies to see what once was. You can imagine that squirrel just having a field day, hopping from tree to tree. But you know, one thing that Tommy never did is he never talked about grasslands. And I think if I had been born in, um, say, Nebraska or South Dakota and, and raised there, it certainly probably would have been on the curriculum. I would have learned about um, the, the Plains Indians and um, sod houses and Oregon Trail and so many other things as part of that curriculum. But I wasn't. I was born in Tennessee. And so I was taught this sort of forest-centric perspective of American history. Let me read to you one of my favorite quotes that I think per perfectly captures the essence of what we're talking about here. It would be difficult to imagine anything more beautiful for as far as the vast deep green meadow adorned with countless numbers of bright flowers springing up in all directions. Only a few clumps of trees, now and then a solitary post oak were to be seen. It was here I first saw the prairie bird, or the barren hen, as we called it, which I afterwards met with in such vast numbers on the great prairies of Illinois. And here the wild strawberries grew in such profusion as to stain the horses' hooves a deep red color. Reuben Ross, 1812. You know, that sounds like something you would hear on a Ken Burns documentary. Um, it's just a, this iconic American landscape. To hear me read that, you probably would think, well, that's got to be Nebraska. That photograph has to be Nebraska. But instead, it's one hour northwest of Nashville, Tennessee. You're looking at one of the largest prairies in the southeast, and it's an area here that's called the Penny Royal Plain. Um, in its early day, it was known as the Big Barrens. And the prairie bird or the barren hen, as old Reuben Ross called it, was uh, the greater prairie chicken, which today is found in Illinois and Iowa, and mostly in areas of the Great Plains. And of course, it's no longer here. It disappeared about the same time that Reuben Ross wrote those words. So that was my knowledge of grasslands as a kid, was that if you wanted to see grasslands, if you wanted to experience prairie, you had to go to the Great Plains. I didn't realize and have the advantage of being able to, to, uh, to know about that quote until I became a professional. Fast forward a few years and I'm in graduate school at the University of Tennessee. And I happened to um, be located, my office was right next to that of Dr. Hal DeSelm. And he was already in his 70s at the time as one of the leading experts on the grasslands of the Southeast. He gave me a copy of one of his publications that he published in 1993, which showed the major grasslands within the Southeastern region. 
And you'll see then that those pennyroyal plain prairies are shown here in Kentucky and barely into northern Tennessee. Uh, there's another big swath of prairie called the Black Belt of Alabama and Mississippi, the Jackson Prairie of southern Mississippi, the Florida Dry Prairie south of Orlando, the Coastal Prairie and the Cajun Prairie of Texas and Louisiana, and finally the Grand Prairie in eastern Arkansas. All those stars represent very small patch-like prairies that were found across parts of the Carolinas and Tennessee. But then in 2013, um, a pretty incredible map came out by some very reputable conservationists. This map was produced by NatureServe and the World Wildlife Fund, and it shows the distribution of the grasslands in North America. There's only one major problem. Where are those big black polygons in Tennessee and Alabama and Florida? They're not there. And so right away, I had to sort of reconcile why the leading, some of the leading experts in the land were not including the Southeast in their concept of grasslands. They cer certainly were not forests. So that was something I couldn't quite understand. Now, I will mention here, they barely do include some of the uh, areas that we consider the broader Southeast region. So the, the coastal prairies of Texas and Louisiana are included as are what we call the Blackland Prairies of Texas are part of our map here. That same year though, a really foundational uh, book came out called Forgotten Grasslands of the South by Dr. Reed Noss of the University of Central Florida. In it, he begins to build the case for why the Southeastern US is a, um, a forgotten grassland region of the world. In fact, not only is it an important grassland region, but it has more species of plants and animals that are dependent on grasslands than the entire Great Plains of the US and Canada combined. Reed begins to unfold this magical story about how the grasslands in the Southeastern US are very ancient. They, have, they possess a certain antiquity that goes back millions of years, back to a time when uh, they were grazed by camels and rhinoceros here in Eastern North America. So first of all, let's talk about a definition of grasslands. Since a lot of people visualize the Great Plains, let's look at what some of the leading experts uh, use to define a grassland. Cecil Frost in 2006 says that a grassland is any community in which the grass layer with its associated forbs, what we call wildflowers, is the dominant layer in terms of either total cover or biomass or both. Copeland in 1991 added um, a little bit of a qualifier to that. He said, in some instances, shrubs or trees emerge above the canopy of grasses as scattered individuals to form what we call savannas. An ecosystem may be designated a grassland when the canopy of grasses is continuous or nearly so. So this allows for grasslands to actually have some scattered trees, just like the cover of Reed's book here, which you can see um, has um, uh, mostly an open space, but with several scattered pines there. So in Reed's book, he begins to um, sort of paint a picture of a diverse set of grassland communities. And so if you look here at this assemblage of photographs, in the upper left, we have the open treeless prairies of Kentucky and Tennessee and parts of Arkansas. We have uh, the savannas, which are grasslands with scattered trees. In places like Western North Carolina and parts of Virginia, we have mountaintop grasslands, which are very much akin to places like Mount Katahdin, Maine, or Mount Washington, New Hampshire. In many areas across the South, including Maryland, we have rocky glades and barrens, uh, like Soldier's Delight, for example. There are many kinds of uh, beach dune type grasslands as well. They're found around the Southeast. There are many kinds of open herbaceous wetlands um, that we call bogs or fens, seepage wetlands, wet meadows. These all sort of group as types of open wet grasslands. There are also marshes like the Delmarva Bays and in some of the deepest canyons of Southern Appalachia, for example, along the Gauley River and the New River of West Virginia or the Yakagani River of Pennsylvania are flood maintained grasslands that are located along high intensity rivers uh, that have class three, four, and five whitewater in some cases. So the lesson then is that 
if we, we really do need to abandon this concept of the squirrel as being able to travel from the Atlantic to the Mississippi River. Why? Because the eastern U.S. was riddled throughout with open landscapes. In fact, we would contend that that squirrel would barely have even been able to leave the Atlantic coast. Immediately, he would have been hit with massive savannas and prairies. Um, and so the, the lesson then is that the southeastern landscape was not the Great Plains, but yet it was also not a continuous forest. Rather, it was a mosaic landscape that consisted of forest patches with open woodlands, wetlands, and grasslands all scattered in, in uh, close proximity. Now, another point that is, is worth making is some people say, well, I just can't understand why you might recognize something that is dominated by trees like a pine savanna as a type of grassland. One fairly simple explanation to that is, is shown here in this photograph. Above, you've got a fairly simple canopy of maybe two or three species of trees, but down on the ground floor is where the bulk of the biomass is. That's where the, the greatest uh, richness of plant species is located. And here, most of those species that occupy that, that ground floor are perfectly capable of dealing with completely open sunlight conditions. Meaning that if you remove almost all those trees, most of those species are perfectly happy in full sun or, or, or very high sunlight levels. So we would call those species heliophytes, basically meaning they are sun lovers. And so what we often see is that these sun lovers will go from an open grassland into an open woodland, but they usually do not survive in a closed canopy forest, at least not for long. Now, in the foreword of Reed Noss's book um, is a very important section uh, that's written by famous Harvard ecologist and Alabamian, Dr. E.O. Wilson. He writes that, uh, and he actually coins a new term here. He says that these grasslands in the South are what he calls the Southern grassland biome. I want you to think about that. A biome, that's, that's a big concept. When it's properly defined to include the lonely pine savanna and its intermittent hardwood bottomlands, it's probably the richest terrestrial biome in all of North America to understand, cherish, and preserve the great natural heritage of the Southern grassland biome should be a priority goal in America's environmental movement. That's a powerful words from one of the leading ecologists of all time. So in 2015, just a few years after Reed Noss published his book, he and several other colleagues, including one of our collaborators and our, our chief botanist for SGI, Dr. Alan Weekly, and several other authors, um, proposed that the southeastern U.S., particularly the U.S. coastal plain, should be designated as the world's newest global biodiversity hotspot. That was accepted by Conservation International and the Critical Ecosystem Partnership Fund. And that's a recognition uh, of the fact that there is outstanding levels of biodiversity in the southeast, lots of endemic species that occur nowhere else in the world. But it's also recognition that um, that much of that biodiversity is imperiled and has been destroyed. So how do we know where grasslands were? Um, we definitely need to have science on our side, but we also need to have history on our side. And the historical record is clear that these grasslands did exist and they, many of them were quite expansive. The first map that I can find of grasslands um, in the Maryland region is this one by Barry and Sanson from 1680. Let's zoom in a little bit on the area that shows Maryland. And you can see right here along the edge, um, there's the Atlantic coast, and you can see the Albemarle River. And if you look just to the interior of that, you can see the Appalachian Mountains. And, and cartographers had been mapping the Appalachians by this point for almost uh, at least a half century. So, but this is the first time that they actually map the savannas. And you'll see the word there, savanna, stretching across what is probably the Piedmont, possibly the coastal plain of North Carolina and Virginia. Now later maps would call that the Grand Savannah in some cases. Now here's another map. This one is a French map from 1720. And if you look here, it shows that there are um, savannas in northern Florida, savannas in, in the Piedmont of South Carolina. 
all level and good ground in northern Alabama. That's sort of code for grasslands. And then savanna land and good pasture ground in central Tennessee and Kentucky. Now, in many areas across the east, and including Maryland, we have early land survey records. In the case of Maryland, your records go back into the 1600s. And so when people were first granted uh, properties and, and, and started laying off blocks of land and claiming ownership of those, they would um, hire a surveyor who would go out and survey their, that property. And so what they would frequently do is they would use trees as the boundary markers throughout most of the, of the eastern part of the country. So in this particular case, this is a land survey from East Tennessee, and it shows a walnut in the northeast corner. Then they walked south and they had to use a stake. There was no tree in that particular location. Next, they had to use a stake again, then a red oak, and then stake, 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 you get the picture. Now imagine if we could go into the historical archives um, and begin to map all these old records. And, and some historians have done just that. Um, we could map all these and put them into GIS and look at the relative density of how frequently did they mention a stake and where did they map those stake occurrences. If we have a high density of stake, that's a good indication that there's a low density of trees. So in this case, we actually know from other lines of evidence, and that's what we want to do, is overlay this with more information. So let's take a look at place names. Glade Branch. That happens to be a name that in, in Tennessee and potentially in westernmost Maryland is used for boggy uh, situations or what we might even think of as a bog. Here's Meadow Branch. Again, these names were given by the very earliest surveyors, in this case, who came through in the 1790s. What's really nice, though, is when you can overlay that with actual written quotes that describe the landscape. So here, just an hour west of Knoxville, Tennessee, they talk about a vast upland prairie covered with grasses and gambling herds of deer, elk, and buffalo. That's a really cool quote, and um, it's, it's neat that we can overlay all those various elements onto this to create a fuller picture. <clears throat> but I am not trained as a historian. I'm trained as a botanist. And one of the things that I love is I love looking at the distribution of plants. And so one of the things that we've learned that we can do is every species has a story to tell. And we at SGI call those storyteller species. A blackjack oak, for example, um, it needs very dry, sterile soil. It can tolerate full sun. It can tolerate regular fire. You'll never see blackjack oak growing in a very moist environment with deep humus and lots of nutrients. It just doesn't happen. So there's a certain amount of reliability with a blackjack oak that you know when you see one that there are certain conditions of the land and climate and soils that you can expect to be associated with blackjack oak. The same is true of some type of sunflower or meadow jumping mice or Henslow sparrows or some type of rare moth that may only um, uh, nectar on one particular type of flower. Even burrowing crayfish uh, like the Piedmont burrowing crayfish need open wet grassland habitats. So we can map all those, and that serves as a good proxy for understanding where grasslands are on the landscape. Why? Because these species can't just thrive anywhere. They have to exist within a fairly functional, intact grassland community. And of course, one of the best things that, that speaks for itself is when we can find actual living grassland remnants on the ground. So here's a couple of examples. One on the left is in a power line right away in Tennessee. But nowadays, we're actually able to use science in a much more predictive way. And this is a great example across Tennessee and Missouri and Kentucky where uh, researchers uh, were able to model the landscape and based on what you would expect the land to uh, support in terms of vegetation. Some types of landscapes are better at supporting forest. Others are better at supporting prairie. So what these researchers did is they began to map all this out. And they said, okay, let's, let's um, put the geology in, let's put the soil types, let's put the annual rainfall. <clears throat> they began to assemble a data set of more than 30 different characteristics of, of the land 
dividing it up into very fine cells. And then a computer algorithm would um, basically predict, based on that combination of, of, of characteristics, what that particular grid cell on the map should be. Should it be a forest? Should it be a wetland? Or should it be a prairie? In this particular case, it gave us some really cool but not unexpected results. So here in Tennessee, for example, in parts of Missouri, it shows much of this area should be savanna. The area north of Nashville was prairie. And the areas dipping down into Alabama were also prairie. Now, it's important to realize that we do have a lot of evidence for grasslands existing on the landscape. So why don't we hear more about them? Part of that reason is what we call shifting baselines. There simply has been an erosion of knowledge by everyday people. So this is a scene from what was Baltimore County in the 1750s, uh, just north of Baltimore. And it shows the area that um, is up along the um, Pennsylvania line. So here's York, Pennsylvania, I'm circling, for example. The great wagon road from Philadelphia that went down into Virginia goes through this region. And this is an area that we know from a series of, um, of descriptions uh, was a big area that they called barrens, which is a term used to describe grasslands in Maryland. But imagine you were on that wagon and you were heading from York uh, west on that great wagon road. If you lived in that period of 1750s, it would be common knowledge to you and your parents and your cousins and everybody in your community that that area was a grassland region and you would refer to it by the name of Barron's. But what happened when a lot of people started moving into that region? Well, one of the things they did is they kicked out the Indians. And by kicking out the Native Americans who routinely set fire to that landscape, all of a sudden that land, which was very much fire adapted, stopped burning. And those grasslands that were very much dependent on either Native American fire or lightning fire, all of a sudden then began to grow up into forests. And there are descriptions of this area changing in the matter of just a couple of decades of rapidly transitioning into thickets. Now, some might suggest, well, doesn't that suggest that these aren't natural at all, that they actually want to be a forest? Hardly, because we have to keep in mind that fire has been burning the Eastern American landscape for hundreds of millions of years. And Native Americans, while they definitely burn the landscape frequently and often, they've only been in, in, in this land for about 14 to 15,000 years. So fire has been here in part of this Maryland, Pennsylvania landscape for a very long period of time. So what happens then as you go through a couple of generations? Well, uh, gradually the parents of these people who are on a wagon or their grandparents, they ride through there a hundred years later and the landscape is no longer a grassland, but rather it's a forest. So they begin to tell their kids stories about not seeing grassland, but rather that about seeing a forested landscape. So through that, <clears throat> we begin to see the erosion of knowledge through the course of generations. And we also see the destruction of grasslands that largely mirrors westward migration of people in this country. So for example, we can see that the grasslands on the Atlantic seaboard largely are gone 26 years before our nation was founded. By the time you get into parts of East Tennessee, those grasslands held on a little bit longer because that it was taking longer for people to move into those areas or, or for Europeans to move into those areas. So by 1800, those grasslands were disappearing. By 1860, the Civil War, those uh, grasslands were largely on their way out east of the Mississippi River. Uh, by 1930, many of the grasslands uh, east of Texas were already uh, in strong decline or almost gone. And then by the 1950s, a lot of the grasslands as far as Dallas and Fort Worth, Texas, really were in sharp decline or, or almost gone. So why did Reed call them forgotten to begin with? Well, let me read to you one um, quote and that I think really sets the scene and applies to the Carolinas, Virginia, and Maryland um, especially. This is a quote by William Foote, who, while published in 1846, he was describing the vicinity of Charlotte, North Carolina, prior to the year 1750. Think about this. <clears throat> he says, previous to the year 1750, the solitary cabins were found upon the borders of prairies and in the vicinities of cane breaks, 
The immense ranges, abounding with wild game, and affording sustenance the whole year for herds of tame cattle. Extensive tracts of country between the Yadkin and the Catawba rivers, now waving with thrifty forests. Think about that. Now waving with thrifty forests. Then were covered with tall grass, with scarcely a bush or a shrub, the abundant grass luxuriating in its native wildness and beauty. Gone by the year 1750. This is the reason, ladies and gentlemen, why my teacher, Tommy Johns, didn't tell me about grasslands, because he didn't know about them, and neither did his teachers or the teachers before him or those before him. You really have to get back. If you're east of the Mississippi River, you ha your teachers have to, you have to get back well into probably prior to the Civil War before people had uh, still clinging to the knowledge that these grasslands once existed. So what we like to say is that most of the grasslands east of the Mississippi were never photographed because they were gone before the camera was invented. They were never painted or illustrated. And many areas across the Southeast were not adequately described. That where component of the who, what, when, and where was simply not recorded accurately. And for that reason, many of these grasslands have escaped our collective memory as a society. Let's take a look at the three sort of common types of grasslands in terms of what they look like and where they are today, okay? About 100 million acres of the Southeast, we think was like a, a tree grassland or a savanna as shown on the right. So these were, would be pine and oak savannas. Let's take a look and see what happens to those pine and oak savannas through the course of time. With fire suppression, which is really needed to keep them open, they became closed canopy forests. It's the same scene. Now let's take a look at what happens with the, the fertile pastures, the native, native range, the native pastures of places like the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia, for example, underlain by rich limestones, great grazing lands. These areas eventually became overgrazed in the early 1800s and 1700s. And then they brought in their European grasses and white clovers to replenish them and to try to heal those lands. So today we see areas that are planted in European grasses, oftentimes in areas that once were native rangeland. And then finally, many of the areas that were very productive soils became replaced by agriculture. Tobacco agriculture in Virginia and Maryland was sort of the first cash crop and quickly was followed by cotton. And you have to imagine, when we talk about an untold story of American history, what was the impact of having all these open grasslands toward the rise of slavery, the very rapid rise of large-scale agriculture in this country? Think about it. If you're going to try to... Um, um, grow a massive cotton crop? Would it be easier to go into an already existing grassland or would it be easier to go into an area and fell a thousand acres of forest, clear it, burn it, and then plant it? You can see that having these already open lands great, greatly facilitated the rise of agriculture and slavery and, and put our nation at an economic advantage. Um, and so how does that figure into the trajectory of American history? We believe that story has largely never been told. Now, there's a book, um, uh, an article by W.B. Uh, Mari, who says that many an old farmer born and raised within the area of the Barrens, this is north of Baltimore, would stand you down in the face of irrefutable evidence that his part of the state never was nor could have been a Barrens. People simply were in disbelief because the land just looked so forested, they could never believe it was once grassland. So what's left over? Well, basically the stuff that's too rocky or too wet or the stuff that's kind of on the edge or in some type of corridor that can't be used for another land purpose. But as you probably well expect, even these power line corridors now are under threat from things like herbicide application, especially since the 1990s. But that's where most of our savanna remnants and prairie remnants remain in the east, in some, in some regions at least, are in these power lines. 
Let me quickly review the sort of six states of southeastern grasslands. They exist in, in, in these six sort of states of conservation. The first type are those which are relatively secure, and I'm going to use that term very loosely because even these have sustained some pretty profound change. The example here is an old growth grassland. That's a foreign concept to some people, but this is on the top of the highest mountains in the Appalachians in, along the North Carolina Tennessee border. These are called grass bulbs. The second category, and, and by the way, those I should mention are doing okay because they're primarily uh, contained within federal lands and uh, they mostly have been sort of protected and, and uh, somewhat managed through the years. The second category are those that are primarily occur on the western edge of the southeast, <clears throat> where there's still quite a bit of prairie to lose. These are what we call rapidly deteriorating. So a few years ago when we started SGI, we went out to the Oklahoma and Arkansas border to film a video. And we went to a site where we were gonna take a time-lapse footage of a particular flower that was opening. And we got there to find that there's a new subdivision going in right on top of this pristine virgin prairie that we wanted to photograph. In fact, I can tell you how pristine it was and it's easy to see here. You see those mounds that are out there on the ground? Those are 5,000 year old natural windblown mounds called pimple mounds. And those are indicative of virgin soil conditions. So we get there and the contractors on site said, yeah, you better go out there and take a look at it while you can because uh, it'll be gone in 30 days. And it is. This is the, one of the last remnants of a large prairie that used to occupy uh, Fort Smith, Arkansas. And these prairies are rapidly disappearing. The third category of grasslands in the south are those that are actually doing quite well right now. They look good. This is a beautiful grassland in South Florida, not far from Miami. But the challenge is that due to current uh, predictions of sea level rise as a result of climate change, these grasslands will be totally underwater or at least suffering from saltwater infiltration by the year 2100. I think most scientists now agree that we pretty much have to give up on that particular group of grasslands for the long term. The fourth category are those that are functionally extinct. These are ones where by and large, more than 95% of these types of grasslands have been totally eliminated. Great example here is from Eastern Arkansas, from the Grand Prairie. If you look here on this map on the left, this um, area of sort of pink, shading shows an area that was 500,000 acres of prairie as of about 1810. But today, all that's left are these bright red patches and lines here, just these little bars and these little dots. Now in 2017, that amounted to about 450 acres. Now think about that, a half million acres down to 450 acres. That's all that's left in 2017. But by the next year, it went down even more to 375 acres. We are still losing acreage in an essentially extinct ecosystem. So my co-founder who's on this uh, uh, webinar, uh, Theo Witzel, was walking through one of these prairies uh, several years ago and he stepped on a rock until he realized that there are no rocks in Eastern Arkansas at the surface. And so he retraced his steps, he went back through the prairie, and he reached down to see that rock that he thought he was stepping on, and it turned out to be not just any kind of turtle, but an ornate box turtle, which had not been seen in that region since about 1983. It was the first occurrence since that time period. I was five years old in 1983. Now, he didn't have his camera on him that day, so what do you have to do? He took that turtle because it was such a significant scientific discovery and he drove it all the way back to Little Rock where his camera was in his office. He goes up, he's got turtle in hand, he gets his camera, drives all the way one hour back to the prairie, photographs the little turtle and sits it back in. And eventually uh, he and a colleague published it because it was such a significant discovery. So we've been thinking about writing a children's book called Rocky Goes to Little Rock. But I want you to take a look and what that line represents there. That long skinny line. Yeah, now take a look at the bottom right image. That's what that line represents. 
it's about a 50 foot wide swath of prairie. Now, while it goes on for a few miles down that road along Highway 70 in East Arkansas, that's all that's left. And in that single 50 to 75 foot wide swath are 440 native plant species. Many of those are rare, threatened and endangered species that no longer occur anywhere else in that entire ecoregion. It's the last of the last. So when we say these are functionally extinct, we mean it. Now, there's a fifth category. These truly are the epitome of extinct. Now these grasslands, look at how vast and wide and large those are. Look at that image in the upper right. That's Long Island, New York. That's the Hempstead Plains in the southwest end of Long Island, just 10 miles from downtown New York City. That was 10,000 acres of open prairie as recently as about 1905. Can you believe that? And there was a bird out there, the heath hen, which also was known up and down parts of the mid-Atlantic, which is basically the cousin of the greater prairie chicken, like the one Reuben described seeing around Nashville in 1812. But that species is now totally extinct. So how much prairie was in the Hempstead Plains? 10,000 acres. What's left? About 20. 20 acres out of 10,000 in one patch that's not anything to work with. So we can pretty much declare that ecosystem as fully extinct. Now this last category uh, is, should be something that would give us all hope because these are what we call highly restorable grasslands. Throughout the Southeast, again, about a hundred million acres used to be savannas, but due to fire suppression, they became closed forest. In Tennessee, at one particular site, they went in and opened up some of these forests because they had a good hunch that if they did, they actually might be able to restore it. Let's we'll see what happens. So when they opened it up, they were able to go from about 30 species of plants on the ground to over 330 species on the ground. Now, prior to that opening up, almost all the rare species and the conservative native plants were not found in the forest. Where were they? They were in the power line corridors that, trans that, that went through the forest. But by opening this back up, did those species recolonize from the power lines? No, they came back from the seed bank and the rootstock bank. Now here's the impressive part. We think that um, they were there possibly for as long as 75 years. Now think about that, from 30 to 330 species, able to bounce back after more than a half a century. But the question I would pose to you guys is, we know that seed banks and rootstock banks in some cases can last a half century, maybe three quarters. Can they last 80? Can they last 90? What about 100? We, would, we believe at SGI that we're on the precipice of something that has never happened before in the, in the natural history of North America. We're about to see the extinction of the underground seed and rootstock bank. And if we pass that point of no return, we will never be able to recover these savannas. But fortunately, in some areas of the Southeast, by thinning those out, by using timbering, that is an absolute necessity in some areas. Coupling that with prescribed fire, we can restore these communities to a high quality. So much so, in fact, that conservative species like this uh, yellow fringed orchid, which is a rare species in Maryland, are able to come back and proliferate. Now there are hundreds and hundreds of these at this one site. And rare animals are coming back as well, like prairie warblers. So let's talk about Maryland for a second. Let's talk about the grassland ecosystems of of Maryland. Um, we can generally break them down into several categories. This is not all of them. These are some of the major ones. Um, and I'll, this table uh, will be here. Uh, if, I'm sure if it's recorded, then you'll be able to check this out in your own time. But basically, there are beaches and dune type grasslands. Uh, there are wetland grasslands, those on glades and barrens and outcrops, and um, prairie-like and savanna-like grasslands in Maryland. So let's talk about each of these. Number one, I, I can't spend a lot of time on any of 
these because uh, because of time here. But um, I do want to point out just real quickly um, a, a really interesting example with respect to the coastal dune grasslands over on the Delmarva Peninsula. You guys have a totally endemic uh, firefly in Delaware um, that's found at about six or seven sites there called the Bethany Beach Firefly. And it's uh, found exclusively in these freshwater wetlands uh, in these areas called interdunal swale wetlands. Uh, here on the image on the right, you can see the, the dune in the background and what we call the interdune grassland uh, is in the foreground. There's a whole host of species that are found there. Um, many of them are found up and down the Atlantic uh, seaboard, some all the way to Texas, some all the way to, to Maine. And it's an interesting mix in both these beach communities as well as these tidal marshes of northern species and southern species. And as you might expect, Maryland has a good mix of both of those. So with respect to tidal marshes, um, you know, these are sort of the, at the extreme edge of what many would consider grassland, but they obviously are not a forest. On the Delmarva Peninsula, you also have um, these open marsh habitats called uh, uh, Delmarva Bays, which are very similar to the Carolina Bays down farther south. Uh, these areas have extensive marsh habitats and they support uh, a couple of dozen rare species at least. Um, and, and there are hundreds of these Delmarva Bays uh, across uh, parts of Delaware and Maryland over on the Eastern Shore. Here's a map showing the relative density of some of these Delmarva Bays. Now what's really important to think about here is look at the surrounding of that natural pond. It's a very dense forest um, that has a lot of loblolly pine in it. Part of what I want you to think about in this next segment uh, dealing specifically with Maryland uh, grassland and grassland related communities is while this is, um, you know, by all accounts, it would be a wet grassland or, or a marsh, think about the dynamics uh, or what it means if, if it's surrounded by a community that's undergone major change. While the marsh itself may be much like it was 200 years ago, I would suggest that those surrounding areas, those dense forests, are very different than they were 200 years ago. So a lot of rare species are found in Delmarva Bays, uh, many of which are deep south southern species found in Lonely Pine Savannah country. You can kind of see some of the range maps of some of the species that um, are, are more common in places like the Carolinas and Florida. As you move a little bit inland, and perhaps even surrounding some of these Delmarva Bays though, is a very enigmatic type of community that we just simply don't know much about. In fact, I would say that it's, for this region of uh, the Mid-Atlantic, it's virtually undescribed. And it is uh, the coastal plain savannas that would have existed in places like Maryland, Delaware, and Northern Virginia historically. This is a, uh, a military base that's down in Northern Virginia, uh, just a, about an hour or so south of DC. You can see the shortleaf pine. Uh, there's post oaks at this site, um, lots of prairie grasses. The site's burned quite frequently. Here's a photo by the Virginia Natural Heritage Program of a site um, uh, with a similar savanna structure. So the question again is, did some of these savannas uh, did they sort of form a ring around these Delmarva Bay communities? Um, how, how frequently did these occur in, in uh, parts of uh, the Mid-Atlantic? We simply don't know the answers to that very well. But a lot of the species that are tracked by the Maryland Natural Heritage Program um, are savanna indicator species. Um, various types of peas, uh, Iris prismatica, Schwalbe americana, which is federally endangered, Ludwigia hirtella, these, I would argue, uh, although most of these um, either have been extirpated from the state or if they do occur in the state, primarily occur in power line rights away, the fact that they occur in a power line should not discourage anyone from thinking that, oh, well, that's a man-made habitat. So, you know, these plants really aren't, aren't truly rare. No, absolutely not. It's anything but. These things are surviving in the power lines because the power line corridor is the closest thing to conditions as they would have existed in 1650. The, the power lines in Maryland and Delaware oftentimes are the most precious remaining habitats that you have left in many parts of the Mid-Atlantic. And they should be guarded heavily because nowadays we're dealing with the threat 
of rampant herbicide application. And once they get sprayed, they can potentially be devastated and, and possibly forever. Now, one of the ways we know savannas were more prevalent in this region is also based on the wildlife. Um, for example, in Dorchester County, Maryland, there are records of the red cockaded woodpecker, uh, which is a species that today you have to go to places like Fort Bragg in North Carolina to see that among the lonely pine savannas down that way. So mercy, mercy me, things ain't what they used to be. Um, the, the landscape that our ancestors were familiar with it was so open that a wagon could ride through the woods, through these open grassy and flower rich savannas, simply do not occur anymore. Instead, what we're left with are completely fire suppressed and choked forests, like what you see in the bottom left. And of course, nowadays in most of the mid Atlantic, invasive species are also uh, extremely problematic. Now, I don't have time to, to talk to about too many uh, details here with the magnolia bays, and I'm certainly out of my element in discussing them. But what I would say is that these are seepage wetlands located uh, in and near the District of Columbia, and they very well could be similar to what we see in other places across the South along the fall line. Mississippi, Alabama, uh, Georgia, and Carolinas have these seepage wetlands. Many of the same species are shared with those sites farther down South. You have river scour habitats in Maryland, like along the Great Falls of the Potomac is one of the most classic examples of river scour glades and river scour prairies in Eastern North America. And it's a truly remarkable landscape at that. Here's a scene where big blue stem and Indian grass are beginning to emerge in the spring, uh, but there are dozens of rare plants here tracked by the Maryland Natural Heritage Program and Virginia Heritage Programs on either side of the river. Some of these are more glade-like, some of them are more, more prairie-like. And it just occupies a narrow swath of river corridor upstream from DC. Several uh, rare plants shown here include uh, Baptisia australis. Uh, rattlesnake master has not been seen many decades from this habitat. And you've got um, uh, Wes Knapp, who's a former uh, botanist from Maryland Heritage Program, recently redis rediscovered the goldenrod shown in the lower right, which was featured in Washington Post. <clears throat> Let's take a look at where some of these species that occur in river scare habitats uh, hail from. So for example, the map on the left shows the distribution of the rock grape, uh, which is found uh, west of Austin, Texas, and west of Oklahoma City. And yet it's found also on these river scour cobble bars uh, at the uh, Great Falls of the Potomac. Now you guys know a lot about serpentine. I don't need to tell you much here. I'll just remind you though, that we have some Southern examples of serpentine in the Blue Ridge Mountains in North Carolina. Um, and I would encourage you guys to visit those if you're ever down that way. Buck Creek Serpentine Barren, it's a remarkable place. Uh, Alan Weekly, our chief botanist has done a lot of work there and currently is in the process of describing uh, several new species found only on that one barren and nowhere else on the planet. But in Maryland, they are, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, predominantly uh, concentrated around the Baltimore area. There's another cluster uh, up around uh, the northeast part of the state. <clears throat> Lots of intriguing species. Um, some of them are very long range disjuncts. Uh, things like the prairie drop seed grass, for example. The map on the right shows just how rare it is east of the Mississippi River. Now, one of the most, um, I think, remarkable habitats in Maryland are um, the savannas that would have existed in the Piedmont region. And so north of Baltimore and northeast of Frederick up into York, Pennsylvania and that, that area, uh, there are some records dating to the 1680s, 1690s, up through about the 1770s, 1780s, to talk about that area being having extensive barrens. One of the, the best publications for you to read more about this um, is by William B. Murray in a historical document from uh, uh, 1955, <clears throat> titled The Great Maryland Barrens. This is a three-part set published uh, in three um, separate sets that, that same year. One of the quotes from there says, uh, and this is a quote from an early land survey, says, 
but from the heads of the Patapsco, Gunpowder, and Bush Rivers over to the Mono, uh, excuse me, the Monocacy is a vast body of barrens. That is what is called so. But there is no wood upon it besides vast quantities of rocky barrens. Now, Wes Knapp, again, former Heritage Program botanist from Maryland, says that regarding the Piedmont, he's, he thinks that the system is so broken that we really just can't even visualize what we had in the past. But species like the American blue hearts and Orbexulum pedunculatum, the false dandelion, the prairie willow, all of these species were fairly commonly documented from the Piedmont of Maryland in the early 1900s, late 1800s. There are specimens at the Smithsonian and the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia and in other herbaria. But these species now are by and large rapidly disappearing. In some cases, they're gone altogether from Maryland. They are a reminder because they don't have a voice. They're a reminder that they need open savanna landscapes. And as you can see from these maps, how some of these species are colored in orange, indicating they have already completely disappeared from those states. Like Vinera Americana on the left has already completely disappeared from Maryland, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and New York. Other indicators of these savannas would be various shrubs. So hazelnuts, New Jersey tea, various types of crab apples and hawthorns. All these are good indicators for former savanna habitats. <clears throat> I've got two more examples of Maryland's grasslands before I uh, get ready to kind of shift, shift uh, off to a different course here. And I wanted to draw your attention to some that are down in Virginia in the Shenandoah Valley. This is a gorgeous uh, virgin prairie that's located in Bath County, Virginia. Now this is a considerable distance uh, south of Maryland, but I think it highlights what would have once existed in places like Allegheny and Cumberland County, Maryland, out there in the little narrow neck of Maryland in the Ridge and Valley. Here's a few, um, I mean, just a, a gorgeous stand of Liatris spicata, which I think today in Maryland only occurs possibly around Soldier's Delight on one of the serpentine barrens. Here's um, uh, the same site with um, Veronicastrum virginicum and numerous types of sylphiums. Um, and we think that this, these grasslands would have occupied much of the valley bottom floors of the Great Valley. Honestly, they probably extended from Birmingham, Alabama, all the way up through Pennsylvania, possibly even into southeasternmost New York. They were not dissimilar to the glades, uh, was the Shenandoah Valley. Um, and there's a publication in, in uh, Virginia history that talks about it being one vast prairie. Some estimates are that this massive prairie in the Shenandoah Valley exceeded 1,000 square miles in one body of grassland. So one more shot of that Virginia prairie. This is called the queen of the prairie, Philopendula rubra. Sometimes found in prairies, sometimes found in um, wet meadows and fen habitats. You can see that here on this map, it trails right on down out of Maryland, straight down the Great Valley and into the Blue Ridge, even into North Carolina. Napea dioica is a very large type of mallow is found in this valley. But look where its main range is. It's farther back out in the prairies of Illinois, Wisconsin, Iowa. Cyta hermaphrodita is found also down the valley in some of the other areas. Could these be relictual species that once thrived in these prairies or in their prairie margins along creeks. And what about this gorgeous beauty, the white, uh, the eastern prairie fringed orchid, um, just a gorgeous species. It's found in prairies around the Chicago area. But look here, it was found in the Shenandoah Valley up until just a few decades ago. The last grassland type in Maryland is way out west. Cranesville Swamp is a great example of it. It's the high Allegheny wetlands, the peatlands, the bogs with pitcher plants and a whole host of other interesting species. This site is literally on the Virginia, or excuse me, the West Virginia and Maryland line. Lots of Northern species like tamarack and, um, and, and many types of Northern shrubs, uh, sedges and more. If you look on this map again from Jefferson and Fry from 1751, we see that um, this area actually was mapped just West of the, the Cranesville Swamp was mapped as the Great Meadows. In fact, that's the only 
grassland that was mapped by Jefferson and Fry um, in 1751. So a lot of uh, cool species in that region. Again, most of these are northern species that reach their southernmost limit in and around Maryland and Virginia and West Virginia, sometimes getting down slightly farther south into the high mountains of North Carolina and Tennessee. So to, to begin to wrap this up in the next few minutes, let's just talk about the contributions to, to biodiversity and wildlife for these grasslands. Um, the big grasslands of Florida, this one on the left is 55,000 contiguous acres of prairie. It's the biggest prairie left east of the Mississippi. The big, the pine savannas of eastern North Carolina, these were incredibly rich ecosystems. If we were to look in a single square meter of that pine savanna, look how monotonous it looks from this photo. It looks like just a typical lawn with some scattered trees above it, but instead, you're looking at the richest site in temperate North America. Within a single square meter, an area the size of where I'm sitting right now, there are 52 species of vascular plants packed into that single square meter. That's more than any other kind of habitat uh, north of Costa Rica. Now, what we like to say is all that plant diversity is great for animal diversity. In a single power line prairie in uh, Mississippi, that's about 50 acres in size, there are 90 species of bees documented in that one 50 acre power line prairie remnant. Think about that. What, what does that say for grasshopper biodiversity, for all kinds of other insect biodiversity? And then think about the food chain that builds on that. So wildlife, uh, they depend on it as well. So these are literally what we call groceries on the ground. And Animal biodiversity is strongly dependent on grassland habitats. Now, we haven't compiled numbers for all regions of the South yet, but for Tennessee, for example, 34% of our rare terrestrial vertebrate animals, things like pine snakes, bog turtles, uh, some of which you have in Maryland, are grassland and open uh, wetland dependent species. In Tennessee, we have 440 rare plants, 60% of those need grasslands. So I did an exercise leading up to this talk to see what about Maryland? Maryland has more than 300 more rare plants in your state than we do in Tennessee. You have 730 something rare species. 63% of the Maryland's rare flora need or prefer or require grassland, grassland related habitats. That's a high number. Now what these grasslands lack in size, they make up for with exceptional biodiversity. And we're still seeing lots of new discoveries that are being made. In 2015, a colleague of mine in Mississippi named 21 new species of grasshoppers, totally new to science. Just a few years ago, a new blue burrowing crayfish was found in wet grasslands just east of Chattanooga, Tennessee. There's currently a potential new species of mouse found on this high elevation grass bulge atop Roan Mountain in the Carolinas and Tennessee. And just a few years ago, they found a new species of doll's eyes called Boltonia montana, uh, that's found in the Northern Ridgeon Valley, the Shenandoah Valley region of Virginia, hops right over Maryland into Pennsylvania and New Jersey. Very rare species that's found in uh, open marsh habitats that were formerly embedded in savannas. So can we afford to let our last surviving grassland slip away? No, we can't because half of all the rare habitat types in the entire Southeast are grassland habitats they are on their last leg. We're down to our last 1%. We've lost the opportunity in many places in Maryland and elsewhere to do big scale grassland conservation. For example, here is a, a virgin prairie for sale in Arkansas, 10,000 acres for sale in a newspaper in 1904. Think about if some massively wealthy person bought that, we would have the equivalent of a national tall grass prairie in Arkansas today. But what if Lord Fairfax or some other, um, um, you know, very wealthy billionaire also had preserved those barrens in the northern Piedmont of Maryland in the 1710s and 20s? Maryland could have its very own national tall grass savanna or prairie today as well. So the point of this is that Maryland is just as much a grassland state as is Illinois, as is Arkansas or any other, many of the other states in the Southeast. 
But what do you do when you're down to your last scraps? What do you do? Well, we call these postage stamp prairies. And what's unfortunate is like the power lines on the Delmarva Peninsula, they harbor the last most important remnants that are left. And if we're gonna do any attempt at big scale restoration, we're gonna to have to go after those, we're gonna to have to secure those seeds, we have to prevent them from being sprayed by herbicide. We have to act now. I promise you, as we speak, somebody is gearing up to go spray a power line right away somewhere in Maryland and it will be lost permanently. So what happens when you lose habitat to the scale of what we're talking about with the southeastern grasslands? We're talking about destruction of 95 to 99 percent of available habitat. I want you to picture this. Picture all the forest of Maryland. 99 percent are logged and clear cut. All you have left is 1 percent. That's the level of devastation we're talking about. Imagine how people would be up in arms if 99% of the forest got cut. We've lost 90 to 99% of our grasslands in the Southeast, but I don't see people getting fired up about it. I don't see people getting angry about it. We have to figure out a way to affect change. So when you lose that much habitat, guess what? You lose species. We lost bison and heath hens long ago due to overhunting, but it's all these unsung heroes, pine snakes, bog turtles, Mitchell satyrs, butterflies, all these are wiping out. Now we're down to grassland birds, down to pollinators like bees and butterflies. These are garnering a lot of attention, especially to federal and state agencies. But guess what? We need more than that. We need massive philanthropic support. I would ask you guys, because it's in your own backyard, why are massive corporations investing in tens of thousands of trees to be planted in the, in the Shenandoah Valley of Northern Virginia and adjacent Maryland perhaps, but certainly in the Virginia side, when that area is a natural grassland region, not a forest. We are totally misguided in our conservation priorities. So the canaries in the coal mine are all around us and they've been vanishing before our very eyes. If we want to do anything about it, we have to rely on those remnants if we ever want to affect change and restore lar larger acreages. But now I want you to think as I conclude here, what are the priorities for Maryland? What are the priorities for Eastern North America? Well, you see them around you all the time in the places you choose to go camping and hiking. Where are our national parks? They are built around forested landscapes, around wetlands, and around coastal areas and rivers. When are grasslands going to get an equal seat at the table. It's, the, it's past time. Now I'll tell you real quick, we are passionate about our forests, rivers, and wetlands. And I don't mean to imply in any way that we're not, but we need to give equal attention to our grassland habitats. Why? Because last year in a journal Science documented that the greatest group of birds in decline in North America are grassland birds. Pollinators are rapidly in free fall. So I blame all this largely on the myth of the squirrel. You know, such a fanciful story told to me in the sixth grade has metastasized into a tremendous cancer that is eating away the ideas and creativity of this nation in terms of how we can best conserve our natural resources. Please, we need to do away with the myth of the squirrel once and for all. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, I'm gonna just say, um, I'm gonna skip past this because I know I'm kind of short on time. And I wanted to get to um, my last slide, which is until there's a coordinated effort to conserve, research, and rebuild these grasslands, they're going to continue to slip away. So if you can, please uh, make sure you check out our website, the Southeastern Grasslands Initiative. Check out our four programmatic priorities. Read about our conservation strategies and read more about what we're doing with our organization to affect real change. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks very much, Dwayne. I always enjoy listening to your talks, even though I've heard them quite a few times before. There's always something different and always something mind boggling. So right now we have um, six questions and I'm gonna apologize in advance if I uh, mangle someone's name, but I'm just gonna give them in the order they came in the presentation. So early on, Doug Boucher or Boucher 
said, uh, I thought that after discussing the surveyors and their recording of witness trees and stakes, you were going to tell us the relative proportions of each in the overall data from Eastern surveys. But you went on without mentioning the numbers. What are they? That would seem to be an excellent test of what proportion of the landscape was grassland. That's a great, great question. Uh, was that Doug was his first name? Yes. So Doug, the, um, <clears throat> I think the answer there is that, uh, quickly, is that there are two major kinds of land surveys. Um, you probably are aware of this, but um, our listeners may not be. Um, in the East, particularly states like Maryland, Virginia, Tennessee, Kentucky, um, were, were mapped according to what's called the meets and bounds system. So that's where they would use trees as the corner marker, for example. Um, versus the areas that were mapped as part of the Louisiana Purchase, so, and, and a few other areas as well. So like Ohio, uh, Arkansas, Missouri, were mapped under a different uh, mapping technique called um, uh, township range and section. So the difference there is that um, people in the East we're sort of, um, you know, acquiring land very haphazardly. You know, if you fought in the war, you were given some land for your service in the Revolutionary War, and you would go settle very quickly. There was not a lot of forethought on behalf of the American government to go through and systematically map those properties and record those properties in a manner that was going to be later easy to access for historians and, and record keepers. Whereas the stuff that was done farther to the West um, is very much easier to access. And much of that is very systematic and has been summarized uh, completely for some regions. So back to the East then, because of how haphazard it was, those records exist in county courthouses and uh, um, libraries, but most of the times they are either in their original hard copy or their own microfiche or microfilm and very, very few people are actually capable of or are actually mining that data. As you can imagine, it's written in cursive and it's very difficult in some cases to make it out. And so for that reason, then I would say a very small fraction of the land surveys have actually been um, transcribed and made available to the scientific and historical community. So there's a tremendous amount of data that is totally untapped which could help us solve major questions with grasslands in the East. Uh, the biggest study that I do know, just to conclude here, is about 20,000 records that was published uh, over about a 10 year period in Middle Tennessee. Um, and that's about 20,000 land surveys between the period 1779 to 1804. Um, that, however, has not yet been tallied up and mapped. So we can't say for sure like how many stakes and how many kinds of trees there were. That, that's something that still remains to be done. Okay, thank you for that. Um, the next question is the shortest one, but it's my favorite because it is a okay. difficult question that we are constantly grappling with. Uh, and I'm gonna add a little bit to it. Uh, Mandy says, how would you describe to an urban audience the importance of preserving rare species endemic to grasslands? And I would add to that, the importance beyond just the fact that they're rare. Because if someone is living in a time where all these species are already rare, they might say, well, so they're rare already. What's the big deal? I, I'm fine. Oh, well, wow. you gave me the absolute hardest question. Um, my colleagues and I, our team, we grapple with that, honestly. Mandy, I don't know that I can give you a good answer. I just can't. Um, you know, I'm a botanist. And I, I love these things for their own value and beauty, um, even the ugliest weed. But I struggle with that. Some days I feel like I can communicate it pretty well to others, and some days I can't. And unfortunately, I feel like I just cannot, I can't do it right now. I, I, Greg, help me out, please. Well, I mean, I think you've hit it on the head. It's just like, there's lots of arguments that we can make. I think one issue is we don't have uh, tons of data that we can use to back up some of the things we'd like to say. Another issue is we need to know our audience. I mean, I'm talking like a communications geek, but 
you know, different messages are going to resonate with different audiences depending on what their concerns are. So a lot of conservation now is turning to understanding our audiences better so that we can help, you know, relate what we feel is important with what they feel is important, find the common ground. Um, I, I personally feel that at some point we, we are going to have one or two flagship species that might sort of like ta taxol and the Pacific U that, you know, is now one of the most, it's one of the most important discoveries for cancer. Uh, and um, that we're going to find something like that to point to in a rare grassland remnant and say, look, if we had let this go, we would not have X. But so far, we don't have that. We, we use things like Bob White a lot. Um, but that's for the rural audience that cares about hunting. So basically, you've got a very good question there, Mandy. Well, <clears throat> I guess the thing I would say, Mandy, that this helps us with, and I thank you for your question, is that we, we probably should collect these sort of frequently asked uh, uh, questions that really do, uh, you know, stumble us. And I think that you know, it is about knowing your audience, but we should we should think about that and also, um, you know, try to have a, a better response depending on about you know five or six different potential audiences. It's gonna it's gonna really differ uh, depending on who you're speaking with. Sorry, I, that, I think we failed at that one uh, there, Greg and Mandy. Sorry. There are no easy answers sometimes. Okay, the next question is from Steve Lonker, and he says. See, I'm going to read it from where I wrote down. He says, you mentioned the important role of fire in grassland communities prior to the arrival of Europeans. Climate 12,500 to 9,500 years BP, which I think means before present, was more arid and cooler than today, supporting open landscapes and smaller trees. Conditions were arid and hot 7,500 to 5,000 years before present. What is the role of long-term and man-made climate change in producing conditions favorable or unfavorable to grassland vegetation communities? That's a great question. Um, well, um, one of the things that we're currently working on now is we have just convened a, with the support and funding of the U.S. Geological Survey uh, and the Southeast Climate Adaptation Science Center we convened a meeting in January of um, about 50 different experts from across the Southeast region. It did include representatives from uh, Pennsylvania, um, all the way to Florida and, and out to Texas. And so with that, we are summarizing in a white paper that will be published soon, what the anticipated um, science needs and data gaps are with respect to things like uh, climate change and its expected impacts on southern grasslands, land use change, invasive species, uh, fragmentation, and some other aspects. So those, I do encourage you, to, number one, is look for that uh, white paper to be published probably in the spring. But, um, you know, in terms of what the anticipated impacts are going to be, it's, it's difficult because uh, our region is part of 24 states, and I think it's going to depend on a lot of uh, micro sort of uh, climatic refugia. Uh, there's a lot, depending on geology. I think the one lesson I've learned from my good friend, uh, Alan Weekly is that there's so many refugia in the Southeast, uh, forest refugia and, um, um, and otherwise grassland refugia, that they really do act all in very much a differential way. And I don't, I don't know that it's going to be easy to anticipate those kinds of, uh, of changes. Um, but, you know, I think within some areas of a very small distance, you will have communities that are going to be stressed by drought. And, you know, literally within a mile uh, or less, you will have communities that uh, may respond totally differently. It's a big area of needed research, and, and I think with the funding we've got from USGS and the Climate Data Center, we will be continuing that research, uh, but, but it's, it's going to take um, a big team to answer a lot of those questions that we raise in our, in our white paper. Okay, great. Um, the next question we have here, and we're starting to get more questions. We've got a total of nine now, um, some of which- I'll try to make my answer shorter. Uh, okay. Great. Um, let me see. 
Michael Wilper says, in managing power line corridors, how often do you recommend mowing and which result is more valuable, an annual mow for a meadow grassland or every few years to achieve a fluxation between that and shrubby landscape? That's a great question. Um, I would, I would tend, we are working currently, uh, Michael, with the Tennessee Valley Authority, um, who manages about 14,000 miles of power lines across seven states. Uh, TVA, as you know, is one of the biggest energy providers in the, in the eastern U.S., um, and they have a lot of grassland habitat within their power line corridors, and, and um, collectively several hundred species of rare plants across that seven state region. It, caught, it crosses many different kinds of grassland habitats as well. So it's going to depend on whether we're talking about a um, maybe a glade that's underneath the power line. Sounds like what you're asking about is more of a deeper soil, maybe a sandy, uh, mesic or dry type um, uh, grassland that would probably historically have been either a savanna or a meadow or maybe some type of seepage wetland. Um, what TVA is doing, I think, is... Um, is pretty cool. They're, they're using what they call conservation spray. And I know that sounds terrible. It sounds like it doesn't work, but I promise you if it's done well and if it's done under great supervision, which it is, is with TVA, they, they use a team um, of applying very directed herbicide at woody plants specifically and um, are able to do it on sites that have federally threatened and endangered uh, orchids and other plants with very little overspray. So I would encourage you, one, is to investigate some of the um, management techniques that the Tennessee Valley Authority is doing. However, um, there are a lot of places that are um, managing through mechanical means. And um, I have, we have not yet looked at the annual mowing versus, say, every other year approach. I would think given the um, importance of some shrub species in those communities like New Jersey tea and some hawthorns and some other things, I would tend, just speaking off the cuff, I would tend to say it'd be best to probably mow every other year at least rather than mowing them too aggressively um, uh, each year. Um, but that's, that's the best I can do right now with that. Okay, thanks, Dwayne. Uh, the next question is from Doug again. I think we'll be able to get through all these, so I'm just going to go ahead and keep them in order. Um, right. He says, you say that we're down to our last 1%, but do you have quantitative evidence that the proportion was ever much more than that 1%? Yes, I'm asking for numbers. <laughs> do we have quantitative data that the proportion of biodiversity was ever greater than that? Um, I think he's talking about, well, I don't know if he's talking uh, about biodiversity extent of, of grasslands. Could be both. I mean, I, we absolutely have data. Um, it's in a lot of different forms, some of which I touched on. Some of it's in the form of, you know, herbarium uh, specimen records, right? You can look at a period of 200 years and look at the amount of times a given rare species was collected. And we know after a century or more of botanists, visiting those sites that those species simply aren't there. We, thanks to a lot of online um, databases that exist now, where we have millions of specimens of uh, herbarium specimens that have come online within the past three or four years. Now, most of that's not georeferenced, but when it is georeferenced in, in another few years, we're gonna have a remarkable ability to be able to ask some big science questions with regards to biodiversity statistics. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of other metrics that I could that we could discuss, Doug, and um, uh, feel free to shoot me an email sometime if you want to know more about that. Um, there's a potential for a lot of discussion there, I'm sure. But I would say absolutely there are lots of data sets regarding biodiversity decline of grassland species uh, in the southeast and eastern region. Okay, and then now I'm going to combine several questions and a comment. And this all okay. goes back to Mandy's excellent question about, you know, how to, how to convey the importance of what we're trying to do and the importance of grassland species. So first, Kenneth Bauer, I think, he just made a comment. He says, we need to teach children to cherish fauna and flora for their own sake, which I think we all agree with. And then Michael Wilpers followed up by saying, 
Since the American kestrel is declining so badly, might they be used as a charismatic wildlife species to draw attention to preserving shrubby grasslands? And then Rico asks the question, is there available a list of plants now extinct in the past 200 to 300 years used for food, medicine, and cordage? What a great question. Good questions. Um, <clears throat> let's see, the first one there, talking about the American Kestrel, um, you know, we, uh, we partner with Quail Forever is one of our partners, and, you know, we joke with them that, oh, you guys already took Bob White Quail, so there's the one charismatic species that a lot of people uh, can claim there. Um, but yeah, we, we, we would love some suggestions uh, on some charismatic animals that we could adopt um, to kind of help promote. Kestrel is a beautiful bird and, and would make sense. Um, the other question about extinct species. Yes, there is a paper. Um, I actually mentioned my good colleague and, and good friend, former West Virginia Natural Heritage Program botanist Wes Knapp, who now is at the North Carolina Natural Heritage Program. He has just led a team of about about 20 collaborators uh, to look at extinction of plants in North America uh, going back since the beginning of records keeping. And they have a very authoritative, well vetted list. That paper was just accepted for publication uh, last week, in fact. So it should be out later this year or first thing in the spring. And, um, you know, it's not as many species as you would think. It's, it's probably, you know, 115, 120 species or so. Um, it's not a great number of totally globally extinct things in North America. But what, what is striking is when you do examine that number, um, the majority of them occur in grassland and grassland related habitats. More, more than 50%. So I'm just curious, Dwayne, because he asked, <clears throat> I think he was trying to make the connection to um, you know, arguments for why we should preserve biodiversity. And he said, do, is there a record in Wes's yeah. paper about how these plants that have gone extinct were good for medicine, food, or cordage, or other human uses? Oh, I see. Um, there's not, I don't think so, because some of them were lost um, at very early points. You know, um, I'm thinking of a couple key examples were lost in the 1830s, 1840s. Some of them were lost in the 20th century. Um, one that immediately does come to mind is, um, and I'm not sure if he accounted for it in his paper or not, is a uh, um, annual marsh elder, Iva annua variety macrocarpa, I believe it is, was uh, cultivated by Native Americans, uh, the Mississippian uh, culture in the Ohio and Tennessee River Valleys, um, probably up until the 1400s or so. That, that large seeded, um, cultivar or variety or species, uh, whatever you want to recognize it as, is no longer known to occur and is considered to be extinct. Uh, that one was a Native American food crop and, and I think also might have been used for cordage uh, as well. Okay, uh, we have a question here from, let me see, boy, we got more questions coming in. Uh, you need to let me know when you're, you think we should cut this off. It's 1034 now. Um, Bill Pinkston says, I trust, uh, yeah, Jill, whenever, or whomever, whenever we've reached our max, I, I can go as long as you want to go. All right. So Bill Pinkston says, I've planted native flowers and shrubs on the borders of my yard in Rockville and get a lot of pushback for not planting trees because of the belief that Maryland was all a forest. Per your maps, doesn't Rockville lie in a Piedmont prairie? Well, I'd have to research exactly where Rockville is, but I would say this is that if it's on the rolling sort of upland um, areas, west, northwest, north of Baltimore, um, then a lot of the upland areas on this sort of rolling uh, broad, excuse me, broad ridges and, and sort of plains or the sort of the rolling plateau there would almost certainly have been uh, savanna or open woodland historically. But there again, some of the descriptions are that it was very open. Some of them may have been artificially without trees. I think the more natural condition is that they would have, under a typical fire regime, uh, would have had some scattered trees, more of a savanna structure. The Native American burning might have exacerbated that and made them slightly more open uh, than, they, than they might have been otherwise. But I think they still would have been a 
grassland in the sense of a savanna, open woodland, or prairie uh, under some, some combination. Okay. Um, and so then what I would say there is you use the argument of history because um, a lot of people, you know, do sort of gravitate toward history and find that's a cool aspect of it. Okay. And then I just wanted, I don't think you need to address this again. Uh, maybe this could be held, handled offline, but um, Doug wanted to clarify that when he asked that one, per, that one percent question, he was asking about the percentage of area covered. He says he's convinced by the arguments that the biodiversity was high. He was just wondering about area. Um, do we know that we've really lost that much grassland or was it always just a small amount, I think? Oh, I see. Yeah. I mean, it, well, one thing, um, Doug, I would say this is that we currently are part of our objectives for the next couple of years. And Alan Weekly, uh, our chief botanist, and, Alan, and Theo Witzel, our uh, chief ecologist, we're working with uh, NatureServe as well, uh, partnering with them and several others. We've uh, assembled a science advisory team that's, that's growing. It will continue to assemble. But one of the things that we'll be working on uh, for the white paper that'll be published in the spring is a detailed list of approximately 250 grassland ecological types, basically grassland communities for the entire Southeast. Uh, maybe it may be as many as 300. But um, that will then set up the foundation for us to identify, uh, in fact, that a lot of grassland communities still are totally undescribed, like the Piedmont savannas of the Maryland and Pennsylvania region don't exist in the classification. So we first have to know what was here or the best we can. We have to classify it, we have to name it. And then um, going forth, we, the next attempt would be to actually try to map it. And since many of these are gone, it's gonna require modeling to do that mapping. Uh, but we need to bring in a lot of the historical data from land surveys to kind of help inform some of that modeling. So there's a lot to do in the next few years between making the list, mapping it, and then also trying to do the inventory work to study what is left. Then we'll be able to have some semblance of a fairly reasonable estimate. But in, in, the, in the meantime, you're right, we're shooting from the hip the best we can there. Yeah. And then this is uh, just a, a comment. I just want to thank Marsha Watson. She said, um, regarding charismatic species as grassland representatives, the Maryland Bird Conservation Partnership has just launched a farmland raptors project featuring American kestrels and barn owls. And she gave us a link. Ooh. That's very cool. We'll check that out. Um, Absolutely. Beth Johnson says, let me see. Let me, I think we only have two more questions. Um, Okay, so I think Don's question is a great one to end on, but Beth says, uh, relative to charismatic species, what is currently known about the woodland bison and its relationship to southern grasslands? Good question. Um, my understanding, and there's a great book by Ted Ballou, B-E-L-U-E. -E. Uh, Ted Ballou is a professor at Murray State University in Kentucky. Um, Ted Ballou has written a book called The Long Hunt, which is probably the most authoritative treatment on bison east of the Mississippi River. And, it, and that's ex expressly what it's about. It doesn't get into bison, you know, west of the Mississippi. Um, it really goes through a great, almost a state by state, um, very detailed assessment of records of bison. Um, I can't remember what the record state for Missouri, but I do know he, he spends a, a good amount of time uh, discussing bison in Pennsylvania, for example. The, my general um, recollection is that, like you, I had heard that wood bison was a thing, but I think that my understanding that the genetic data suggests that wood bison are not, not a distinct taxon or species or subspecies in the East. That there are two bison species in North America. There's um, the main bison subspecies, bison bison, which is found primarily in the Midwest, in Great Plains. Um, and then there's the uh, bison, I think, Assiniboinensis, which is the, the woods bison that's found in like Northern Manitoba, Yukon territories, it's in Alaska, um, and that, I mean, they look different. They are morphologically and genetically uh, distinct. 
but my understanding is that we do not and have not do not have that um, that type of bison here. The final point I'll make is this: is that Ted Ballou makes a really good case, and I'll, I'll be honest with you. Before I read his book, I did not believe it, but he makes a good case for why bison were essentially absent from the east prior to um, prior to about the mid 1550s. So there's probably a point in time, a period of from about 1500 back several thousand years where there is no record of bison um, in the in the southeast in particular, but also I would say for the Atlantic seaboard states, you would have to get back in the ice ages to find records of other bison species which are now extinct. Um, so <clears throat> I would read Ted Ballou's book. He'll cover it in very good detail. Okay, thanks, Dwayne. Um, we did get one more question come in, but we got from Don Callahan. He says, just a comment that the Maryland uh, Native Plant Society might consider working with other conservation organizations to socialize the idea that reverting some areas to grassland is as important as planting trees, which is such an amazingly good point because this is something, this is yeah. one of Dwayne's favorite uh, issues. And I would, before I turn it over to Dwayne, I would just like to say that, um, there was a group of conservation organizations that gathered in Atlanta uh, last year. I can't remember the name of the meeting, Dwayne, you can tell them. And we Except talked time. about coming up with a set of conservation messages that all of us could kind of start using relative to grasslands and plant conservation in general um, so that it starts to resonate, so that people start to hear it over and over. But Dwayne, why don't you address that? Reverting some areas to grass. Yeah, so one is planting trees. Yeah, I think it's absolutely, please do. Um, you know, with the six states of grasslands that I, that I gave, um, the one that we have, we could reverse <clears throat> the, the negative trends in grassland bird decline as reported last year in the Journal of Science. Fairly easily, I'm convinced. But to do so, and we have literally millions of acres across the greater southeastern U.S. and parts of the lower Midwest, where we have these uh, former savannas that are now closed canopy forests. We have the scientific data. We have the historical record. What's unfortunately standing in the way is public perception, uh, both by the general public and by conservation land managers in some cases. Uh, there is just a general aversion in this country for sometimes good reasons, but in other times it's not well founded against cutting trees and and against fire, of course. But um, there is lots of good data. There are a lot of great case scenarios, and what we oftentimes see is that you know maybe Tennessee is uh, hesitant to do several thousand acres worth of forest thinning and burning because they're just not convinced, right? But yet you can look to Arkansas and Southern Missouri in virtually the same type of system. And they are recovering thousands of acres using thinning and burning and both plant and animal species that are absolutely flourishing. So sometimes we have to look across state lines and ecoregion lines and, and look at good examples that we can lean on. Now, with that said, I would say we can't use that approach everywhere, but we can use it in a lot of places. So for Maryland, I would say where are the areas with remnant shortleaf pine, pitch pine, um, post oak, maybe some other dry side oaks, mockernut hickories? Those would be the type of forested situations, um, maybe pond pine, where I would especially prioritize that. Um, but if you're talking about a moist scenario, you know, there are some areas legitimately that do need to be planted in forest. Um, we, we just need to make sure we're, we're all on the, on the right page and working together. Okay, thanks, Dwayne. Um, our last question right now is from Steve Lonker, and you're gonna like this one. He says, are seeds being collected and deposited in the millennium? I'm not sure if that's supposed to be the name, it's capitalized of a specific seed bank, and other seed banks for the globally and state critically imperiled and imperiled grassland species? That's a great question. So we, we've been very active, um, as have our partners at uh, North Carolina Botanical Garden and, and several of our other partners, like the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center in Austin, Texas. 
uh, with seed, seed work in particular. Now, SGI is very new at this. We're, we're just getting started in the seed world. Uh, I'll do my best to quickly summarize where we're at with that. So North Carolina Botanical Garden um, has partnered in the past with the New England Wildflower Center um, and, and others up and down the Atlantic coast to sort of divide up the effort to collect um, endangered species, uh, and that includes some grassland endangered species, as part of their work um, for this Centers for Plant Conservation, CPC. And they are a designated CPC facility there in Chapel Hill. Um, they also have been working with part of the Seeds of Success effort, uh, particularly after Hurricane Sandy, to collect seeds of what we would call sort of ecologically uh, valuable sort of workhorse species, uh, matrix species of, of beach dune habitats, especially, and estuaries, and um, growing those out for the purpose of, uh, you know, being able to reintroduce those after natural disasters like hurricanes. Um, the Southeastern Grasslands Initiative at our headquarters in Tennessee uh, we will be in the next year or so applying for membership with the Center for Plant Conservation because there's a big void in, this, in the Mid-South region and central part of the country uh, where not a lot of good seed collection, seed banking efforts are happening. Um, we also have just um, are working with the Bureau of Land Management and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Partnership Program to, um, to lead the efforts on Seeds of Success Southeast. Um, that will be made official in a few weeks as that uh, continues to take, take root. And, and as part of that, we will continue to work closely with North Carolina, but really we'll begin to work with a lot of other partners in a lot of states to develop a southeast wide, hopefully a southeast wide um, uh, focus on collecting seeds of both rare species uh, and also collecting seeds for restoration work. Uh, Alan, I wish he could uh, chat, but he's, they're doing great work already in Chapel Hill, um, particularly on developing some Piedmont genotype seed sources for the Carolinas, Virginia area. And, and sometimes, hopefully in the future, those might be uh, made available to where they might, some of those might be suitable for Maryland, for example. Okay, thanks, Duane. Um, one last comment from Bill Pinkston. He said, uh, looks like we're already connected with Xerxes and Lady Bird Johnson. Um, how about the pollinator partnership? Uh, you might be able to answer that, but I, I know that definitely uh, pollinator organizations in general are kind of on our radar as potential partners. We would love to expand our partnership base this year, um, uh, big time. So um, I would encourage all of the participants who are still out there. Uh, one is we definitely would like to partner. So be sure and check our website out, segrasslands.org. You can see the link here. Um, you can go there and sign up to, um, to partner. You can sign up to join our volunteer base. Um, and we've got uh, a number of other resources there as well. I just want to tell you all, it really has been a pleasure speaking with you today and, um, and interacting with you all. Thank you very much for your time and, and for having me. Hey, and Dwayne. thanks to my team at SBI and Greg for helping out. Yeah, Dwayne, can you just say one more thing? Tell folks about our uh, Southeastern Grassland Status Assessment and Conservation Plan. Yeah, great point. So um, through the leadership of uh, Dr. Reed Noss, uh, who wrote, wrote the book on Forgotten Grasslands of the South, uh, Dr. Alan Weekly, our chief ecologist, and, um, and Theo Witzel, our, our chief ecologist, we will be um, uh, launching this fall on an effort to uh, embark on drafting a status assessment and conservation plan for southeastern grassland. That'll be a multi-year effort. Um, to get started, we are going to focus on a particular region, which is the um, sort of the southern part of the Appalachian Plateaus, the Cumberland Plateau of Tennessee. But in time, we will um, need to expand, and uh, this will be a, a collaborative effort with other partners and agencies and organizations. So, Please, all of you guys who are listening, um, we will need to be thinking about working collaboratively over the next few years to draft a plan for the grasslands of the Mid-Atlantic. So if you're interested in that, if you, uh, we might have some resources to bring to the table in the future. A lot of our support comes from the Washington DC based Band Foundation, a philanthropic foundation. 
Um, but we are going to need more help and more partners and more collaborators to do it, to do some conservation planning. I think it's important to note that most of the planning that's gone on in, in across much of the Southeast in the past several decades has really not focused on grasslands first. And that's, that's really the difference that's gonna set apart uh, our plan. Thanks, Dwayne. And um, I just would wanted to point out to folks too that if they do visit our website and they are interested in uh, contributing to the cause, we do also have a link for making donations. And I would like to thank our hosts and turn it back over to Absolutely. them. Thank you all very much. Absolutely. Okay. Um, thanks so much, uh, Dwayne, for your presentation. It was really compelling, and I hope we um, all, you know, want to do something as a result. I know I do. Also, thanks to Greg Elliott for your assistance, and uh, basically to all of the people out there who signed up and your patience and participation in the first remote conference we've ever held. It, it took a little bit of work to get here, but I think it worked. Um, um, and that's it. Um, stay safe, go grassin, and we'll see you soon. And this concludes our program. Thanks again, Dwayne. Take care. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. Okay. Bye. Thank, you. Bye. Thank you, Greg. Bye. Mm -hmm.